Welcome in to the Punt and Pass podcast. I'm your host, Drew Butler. Join alongside my co-host, Aaron Murray. Be sure to follow us on social media at Punt and Pass on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Drew Butler. Aaron is at Aaron Murray 11 And head out over to puntandpass.com, the number one destination for all things college football. It's got our YouTube page up there, which you can obviously go check out anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It has our links our picks as well. We each went two and three last week. That's okay. We're twenty and fifteen against the spread on the season, but we both won our locks. Running away, Murray. Finally, no stress winners on the flip the field free pick and the Aaron Murray lock of the week. Puntandpass dot com. Go check it out. It's got our merch up there as well. The number one destination for all things college football. Well, Murray, week seven is in the books. We are halfway past the halfway point of the 2021 college football season, and we have a ton to break down. It was an unreal weekend in college football, more so off the field than on it. You called the Auburn-Arkansas game. Uh, Great job once again with Noah Eagle and Rick Neuheisel on CBS. Pretty surprising. Arkansas's offense, excuse me, Auburn's offense got going there, and they get a big win on the road against a ranked team. Yeah, well, first off, for a weekend that wasn't supposed to be super exciting, it was a very exciting weekend. Yes. Uh, especially in the SEC. And that Auburn game, I mean, Bo Nix, I said on the broadcast, that was the best I've seen Bo play in three years. And he, he You can't say that because Georgia fans will get mad at you. You can't say that. Yeah, I can't say that. Um, <laughs> it, the, the, I, 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 have, I, I have some love affair with Bo Nix, according to <laughs> Georgia fans out there. Listen, I just, you know, I feel he for did the look kid. good. I, I, I played the position. I know how tough it is. I know how tough it is to be an SEC quarterback and everything that goes along with it. So, you know, that, you know, he came in highly recruited. Yeah. I had that amazing first game versus Oregon. Everyone's jumping on the Bo Nix bus up and down first season, up and down second season. His dad played uh, there. Been up and down third season so far. And it's just, it ain't easy. And yeah. I know a lot of people think it is, but. Uh, the kid's trying his hardest. I, I can tell you that, talking with Bobo and Harson before the game. But it was his best game of his career. He looked really good. The receivers played the best they've played. Uh, it's a good team, man. It, it's yeah. a good defense. It's it's an offense, and if they can play like they, they did versus Arkansas, you know, it's they're going to be dangerous down the stretch. And they got their biggest games this year at home. Yeah. So their season's far from over. This was a big game for both those teams. We said it at the beginning of the show, like, hey, listen. With Alabama losing last week, everyone in the West is like, we're not dead. Oh, yeah. Technically, we're not dead. So this was a game of, okay, are we going to continue to move forward and have an opportunity to to possibly put ourselves in the position to win the West? Or now it's just for Arkansas, figure out a way to make the best bowl game possible. 100%. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Great game for Bo Nix. Tigers were a three-and-a-half point underdog. Nix goes 21-26 to 26 for 292 yards and two touchdowns. Auburn beats number 17-ranked Arkansas on the road, 38-23. to 23. I love the picture of you and Bobo on the field pregame. That was awesome. Aaron posted that to his Instagram. So cool to have your former position coach and really one of your mentors and, and very close friends, and now you're calling a game, and they had success this weekend, which is awesome. I saw a tweet, and we'll get into Georgia here in a little bit. I saw a tweet that said, and this kind of goes to exactly the point that you just made, Aaron, the narrative that Georgia hasn't played anybody is kind of overblown. What really might be the situation is this. Georgia's defense is so good, they make other offenses look extremely pedestrian, which is what you're saying. Hey, Auburn is a pretty good football team. They just hung 38 on Arkansas. Bo Nix, extremely efficient. They get Tank Bigsby going, 18 carries, 68 yards, and a touchdown. They couldn't do jack against Georgia. It might just show you how elite the dogs are on defense because they simply just neutralize opposing offenses and get to work and get done with those teams extremely quickly. It, it, it's a defense, and 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 you know Auburn missed their opportunities, and Bobo wasn't making excuses. We we're talking for the game. I was like, listen, how good is that Georgia defense? And he's like, they're trust me, they're they are the best in the country. But you know, we had our opportunity. Oh yeah, they First did. possession for Auburn. Yep. Shanker misses a wheel route in the end zone, and Auburn could have got, could have gone up seven nothing with a six minute drive, uh, and that could have changed the game. You know, multiple times receivers drop passes, Bo made mistakes. Like they shot themselves in the foot. But you know, what I always tell people is that's the difference between elite teams and good teams. Elite teams make those plays. Good teams are 50-50 on those plays. And right now Auburn's a good team. They're making the plays. Some games are not making the plays. Other games. 
where Georgia is an elite team because they make the plays every single week, and that's why they're number one in the country, and that's why they, they, they really have not been, you know, besides Clemson week one, I've not really had a scare. And, and, and I agree yeah. with you, Drew, that, that, that whole notion of they haven't played anyone is completely BS. Kentucky's a good football team, and I know you don't believe that, because you think Kentucky's still a bad yeah, Well, team. guess what? Now that Georgia's beat them, I think Kentucky's one of the best teams in the nation. There you go. Kentucky's <laughs> a good football team. Auburn is a good football team. And, and Georgia's going to have some interesting games down the stretch, or maybe one interesting game down the stretch. We'll see what Florida looks like. But yeah. Tennessee's not that bad. I agree with that. I agree They're with that. Bad. And I, They're you know, bad. obviously I like to have fun. Yes, Kentucky is a good football team. There's no doubt about it. Georgia's the only team in the nation that has beaten four ranked teams so far this season. So that's completely false, um, meaning the, that they haven't the, played the, anybody. The, the, the margin on that, too, of points. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the closest game is obviously the Clemson game, which was a top three team at the time, and it was 10-3 to without an offensive touchdown. So 47-3, but... uh, it's too, much, too many big numbers, but it's a lot to a little. Yes, that. yes, that is a fact. It's like 120-something to not a lot. Like no doubt. 20-something. Well, you mentioned Florida. Florida went on the road and played their uh, SEC West foe, LSU. Um, unbelievable game, exciting game. Florida loses to LSU, and it breaks yesterday that LSU is parting ways with Coach Ed Orgeron after the season. Just completely head spinning. Um, Aaron, your thoughts? We talked about this last Thursday, and you said, yeah, this is definitely going to happen. Coach O will not be the head coach at LSU next year. You obviously called that one. How about beating a top 20 ranked Florida team and then having it be announced after the game that you won't be the coach of the LSU Tigers next year. I, I don't know what's going on in Baton Rouge. Uh, it seems like they have their eyes set on somebody to where they wanted to get this out. They wanted to let it be known that Coach O will not be back in 2022 because they must be in talks with somebody already. They're paying him his full buyout. Uh, this is a head-scratcher for sure. Well, talk about just raining on their parade to celebrate a huge victory against the Gators. I mean, good Lord. Victory. Let, let, him least, victory. let him at least enjoy the week before you just drop the bomb on them. Uh, but I think, you know, how do you want it? Do you want the Band-Aid to come off slowly or do you just want to rip it off? You know, honestly, I think everyone knew in the building, fans knew it, everyone across the country knew it, that Ed O would not be the coach of LSU in 2022. Why slowly take the Band-Aid yeah. off? Rip it, be done, cut it, uh, let everyone kind of start figuring out a way to get ready for that next season. Who's going to be the new coach? Get on top – it's a premier job. You know, if I'm a coach Absolutely. out there and I'm looking to take the next job, I would take I would rather be at LSU than USC. So if you're gonna be competing with USC to get that next coach, jump on it right now yeah. like them, start getting out there, start getting some feelers. I don't know if they're gonna hire a, you know, one of those firms to go out there and, and, and do their work for them, but it's a premier job. It's a great uh, place. I, to I mean, absolutely they're gonna have their pick of who they want as their next coach. I totally agree. I mean, I, I go back to, and I was seeing this kind of get nixed on, on social media over the weekend. I think Joe Brady. Um, yeah, I think I like you could Brady. get a little bit of a discount because he's never been a head coach before. You know, obviously you're paying Coach O this massive buyout. You like the excitement that Brady brings. He obviously could recruit with the aspect of, hey, I was with Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, one of the best football teams of all time. I think he could bring that youth um, he does have the inexperience of not being a head coach. He does have the experience of understanding how LSU works. And I think what might be most important is they wouldn't have to pay an arm and a leg to get him in the door. I like you said Billy Napier a week yep. ago. I like that name a lot. I don't think Luke Fickle from Cincinnati would go to LSU. I think he might go to USC. Keep in mind, USC's athletic director is the same athletic director that hired him at Cincinnati. I don't know. I mean, I, I just do believe that they have – they have a name that they are ready to move forward with, which with is Lane why Kiffin, with Lane Kiffin jump shit from Ole Miss. What about Jimbo LSU? Fisher? I, I keep seeing well, Jimbo's Jimbo, name thrown around. That yeah. new contract. I would I would agree with that as well. But it'll be interesting, you know. And and again, why they do it now? Either one, they have somebody in mind that they're already talking to, or two, you know, they don't want to have to compete with Southern Cal, like you just said. I yep. mean, there are going to be a couple of premier jobs opening. Ed O. 21 months after winning a national championship, having one of the greatest teams of all time in college football, um, is without a job, but his bank account will be completely chopped. This is forward. why I don't want to get into coaching, Drew. You win a <laughs> national championship and you're on your ass a year and a half later. Um, it, it's just, it's a crazy world. And in the SEC, the expectations, the issue is the expectations are, 
be Saban. You know, the experts say, you yeah. win a national championship, okay, let's go do it again yeah. and again and again and again. And it's not easy. No one has been able to do it besides Saban. And, I know. and, 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 I know. and you, when you have to play them every single year, that's where the bar set. If you're a coach at LSU, AM, I mean, I guess you can somewhat throw AM in there, not really just yet, but LSU, Georgia, Florida, Alabama. There is an expectation in Auburn of you should be competing to be in Atlanta every single year and you should be competing to be in the playoffs. And those expectations are just unrealistic because, like I said, there is only one Nick Saban. But someone who else yeah. is who's, – whose little tushy is getting a little hot right now. Tushy hot. Is our boy Dan Mullen. Oh, I guess you can say bye buddy. Because, you know, oh, you know, you know, buddy. With Dan. What the yeah, shite. Yeah. I mean, what is going on there for the Florida Gators? First off, his butt doesn't need to be hot. I said it to you before the show, Drew. Grantham, Grantham. enough is enough yeah. already. Yeah. yeah, I know you got the relationship. I know you guys were together at Mississippi State. You brought him over with you. It, it's time to move on from Grantham, I believe. Yeah, I mean, look, they you were. You can't tell me you should be getting up that many points and that many rushing yards to LSU, who hasn't been able to run the football the entire football season. Not even rushing yards, like not getting touched, having three yep. yard wide open holes to just get. Directly past the second level, and you are gone. I mean, I could have ran some of those touchdowns in. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really interesting to see. Do they address it during the bye week? Florida and Georgia both have a bye week upcoming in week eight before the cocktail party. Uh, could there be some rumblings around some change in Gainesville? How about Anthony Richardson? Like, after the game, people are asking him, are you going to transfer? Like, that's where we are in college football right now. It's like, hey, are you staying as Florida Gator? Are you going to transfer? And he said something to the point of, like, I love where I'm at. Like time tells all, and then he had to like address it and say, "Hey, I'm sorry I wasn't clear enough. Like I am at Florida. I'm not transferring mid season. It is wild. It's absolutely wild out there. But Florida, the inconsistencies that they're going through this year, unprecedented in Gainesville. They better pull a rabbit out of their hat mm -hmm. against Georgia, or it could get very ugly in the swamp. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, they they need to. They need to make a decision on this quarterback position because yeah. both guys are too similar to continue to go back and forth. I mean, Emory drove him down, scored a touchdown. You put him on the bench. Richardson comes in. Then, you know, what is it, a couple of possessions later, Emory throws a pick. You bench him, put Anthony in. Anthony throws a pick. You bench him, put Emory back in. I'm like, oh, my God. It's man. crazy. Like, I'm watching the coach's copy. It's driving me crazy. And I know it has to be driving the quarterback crazy. I know it has to be driving the offense crazy. And the entire team, like – I think it's time to say, okay, what are we going to do at the quarterback position? Um, you know, Emery, my biggest issue with him, especially watching this past game, is he's just late. Everything is late. There's nothing on time. He's waiting to see the receiver open instead of throwing the receiver open. And that caused the, the, the two interceptions for him. Uh, it caused him to be very inaccurate. It caused LSU to be able to make plays on the football. You know, Anthony's first interception was not great. You know, he's trying to – throw some kind of crazy pass rolling to his right, stupid. Second one wasn't his fault necessarily. Receiver should have probably fought for it a little bit more, and plus he had some pressure in his face. But I think at the end of the day, if you want to say who gives us the best chance to beat Georgia, I think it's Emory. Or that's not Emory. Excuse me. I think it's Anthony Richardson. Okay, yeah. His ability to run, uh, to me, he looked like he was more on time with his throws throughout the game versus LSU. I know the playbook is somewhat limited, but, you know, would you rather a guy that has the entire playbook and is not very good at it or a guy that has a limited playbook but excels at it? You know, I would rather have the guy that has limited, limited with ex excelling. And, yeah. Yeah. Now you got a bye week. I'd get him as many reps as you can. Two weeks to get him ready to go before you face Georgia. Because right now, I just don't think Emory can get the job done personally. Um, you've seen enough. You've had you've had seven games to watch him as a starter. That's ample amount of time, and he just hasn't gotten better. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I totally agree. And they're up against a big-time challenge with Georgia heading down to Jacksonville to take on Florida again. That is the week after this upcoming weekend. One of the biggest stories out of the SEC over the weekend was Lane Kiffin's return to Knoxville. Obviously, Ole Miss taking on Tennessee. The last 20 minutes of the game when there was about less than a minute on the play clock, it just started raining down water bottles, and it started raining down mustard bottles and golf balls. The Tennessee fans were up in arms after a completely horrible officiating call, which is what started all this. Let's not get it twisted whatsoever. I do not condone the actions 
that were made by Tennessee Volunteer fans, but I do think it should be noted that they were made because of horrible officiating, which we have all come to expect now in the SEC, which is really unfortunate. Uh, I thought that that certainly was a first down, Aaron, on that last play. I believe it was like Mm -hmm. 4th and 13 or something. A great play, a great stretch. Seemed like it was, of course, going to move the chains, and Tennessee was going to continue to have a chance to make this a football game. But they didn't. They said he was short. Uh, the line was challenged. Again, they said it was short, and then it just started raining down trash, golf balls, mustard bottles, uh, directed at Lane Kiffin specifically, which is completely unfortunate. Uh, both teams had to kind of go out to the middle of the field so that stuff couldn't get thrown at them. The cheerleaders were escorted off the field. Uh, both Tennessee and Ole Miss's bands were escorted out of the stadium Really, really a bad look. A bad look all around. Greg Sankey made an announcement yesterday about the standards that are in the SEC, how Tennessee will most likely get fined. Uh, What a scene it was, though. Unbelievable. Who brings a golf ball to a football game? Me. I do. Who? Always got to be ready. No, no. Always got to be that ready. Person's like, was it that person's lucky golf ball that they just bring to every single Tennessee game? It was so or, bizarre. I mean, he chucked that going, thing too. Are you going into the football game thinking that you're going to chuck it? Like, why else? I would. I would have to. I would have field? to think the latter. I mean, he he went in there with a plan. If you're bringing a, a yellow that's, golf see, that's, ball, into that's the a problem, man. You got no see. question. First of all, it was awesome to see Tennessee juiced from the start. Great I mean, environment. That place is rocking. Great, Great environment, crowd. yeah. I mean, how good – you've said it before. I mean, how good is it to see when Tennessee's winning football games, the atmosphere is one of the best in all of college football. It was good to see. Not good to see is where they took it to at the end, to throw, to put the players, cheerleaders, band members, coaches, referees in danger um, is is way, way too much. And and, and listen, I, I, the percentage of people who were – making this stupid decision was probably small compared oh, yeah. to 100,000 people there, which is unfortunate. It's always the few that ruin it for everyone, but you can't do it. Um, the safety of the players and coaches and everyone on that field is first and foremost. And I know there was some joking and having fun with Lane Kiffin in the pregame, the booing, you know, he had a little fun, little comment. And <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, that was that's great. That's all fun and games, man. That's, just, that's, that's, that's good love, but, the line was crossed big time, and, and, and Tennessee does deserve to be fined. And those oh, fans yeah. lesson. No doubt, and they will, for sure. Uh, i got to give a shout-out to Jordan Rogers, Tom Hart, and your buddy Cole Kublik, who were on the call. You know, a lot of people wanted the Manning cast for this game. Obviously, Ole Miss versus Tennessee. Eli went to Ole Miss. Peyton played at Tennessee. People have really been enjoying the Manning cast on Monday Night Football. It was a fun little thing happening on social media. Even Lane Kiffin, a couple weeks before the game, said, give the people what they want. So Jordan Rogers and Tom Hart poked fun at it during the broadcast. Did you see this, Aaron? Yep. They, they came back the and they had the cardboard cutouts yeah. of Eli and Peyton in the booth, and Jordan Rogers had line of the weekend. He said, fortunately, ESPN found the second biggest forehead in the company talking about Tom Hart and also a younger brother that was not as good as his older brother at football. Talking about Jordan Rodgers himself, obviously nice. his older brother is Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers. So I saw that live. I laughed out loud. I was like, that's pretty damn funny. Uh, I love self-deprecating humor. But then all the craziness happened, and it was just a really wild ending. 31-26, Ole Miss wins. Tennessee, again, uh, was not able to take advantage of some big play opportunities that they had the past couple of games when they were scoring north of 40 points a game. I thought this one would go over 82 points. Of course, that did not happen. I did think Ole Miss would win and cover. That did happen. You and I were both on Ole Miss minus three. But look, Lane Kiffin's return to Knoxville, you said it. He has fun. He likes to make it exciting and interesting. But a line was crossed. It was unfortunate to see really a stain on the SEC and specifically Tennessee Volunteer fans. Remember this, though. Why do they do it? Horrible officiating. Horrible yes. officiating. That, that's oh, trust a fact. Me. We, had, we had so many calls in our game for Auburn, Arkansas, where we're up in the booth. Like, you know, one, the officiating at times is piss poor, and then the communication. You know, Auburn, what was it? Um, yeah, it was Auburn fumbled the football. Arkansas, we don't know who really recovered it. At the end of the day, it was kind of a, just a scramble. And they went to review it, and they say they came back and said the, the, the play stands. We're like, what? Communicate to us what was the there was never an official call in the field of was forward progress stopped was it a fumble was it not a fumble who recovered it if it was a fumble like everyone's just like even Gene or um our boy Gene Steratore is like I have no idea what was confirmed because there was never a declaration of exactly what the the outcome of the play was 
So communication, I thought this year has been really bad. Um, officiating at times has been really bad. I know it's not an easy job. I know it's it's going 100 miles per hour, and I know for fans at home get to sit back and watch it in super slow motion and get to really see. But it's got to be better, man. Yeah. It has got to be better. And then you know, I do bring up the cameras, but they have the cameras too to go review this and see the angles and know and make the decisions and make the corrections, and they're just not doing it right now. Um, but on a side note about the game, Tennessee football has been really fun this year. Yeah, it has. At least so we can agree on that. Like, you know, for for – for this coaching staff and for where Tennessee's been the past four years plus, they're competitive. They're scoring points. I know it wasn't as many points as they've been scoring, but they're scoring points. They're making games exciting. They're making it enjoyable for fans to go to. And I think that's – that's for any new coaching staff, that's the goal number one. Can we get a buy-in from our players? Can we get a buy-in from the fans? And yep. I think everyone right now is buying into what Hypo's doing. Yeah, I totally agree. It's been fun to watch. Watch out. I mean, Georgia – Got to go up to Knoxville in a couple of weeks. I mean, their defense is so good. You can't really be worried about anything. But uh, I think the biggest problem Tennessee has is lack of depth. They just don't have the dudes right now. Um, And, you know, that's where late in the game you can get exposed. And and Georgia's defense, the way they're playing, um, it's really tough to get anything going against them. Speaking of Georgia, number one ranked team in the nation, they dismantle Kentucky 30-13 to at home. College game day, 3.30 SEC on CBS. The dogs are really good, Aaron. Um, this game was really put out of reach right after halftime. You kind of got the sense that Kentucky wasn't going to get anything going, wasn't going to have the opportunity to get anything going to keep this thing really close. Stetson Bennett, another fantastic game. He is cementing himself as the leader of this football team, Jordan Davis, in that defense, creating turnovers, getting pressure on the quarterback. It's fun to watch. And Mark Stoops calls a timeout with like four seconds left in the game. Down at the one-yard line, runs a play, scores a touchdown to cover. Let's get one thing straight. Mark Stoops knew exactly what he was doing. I mean, I'll tip my cap to him. Pretty impressive. A shocking end to that football game. If you're watching, you're like, this cannot be happening right now. Like an all-time bad beat. You know for a fact that Mark Stoops took pride in that. You know for a fact that he took pride in scoring two touchdowns, right? Did they, did they score or was it two field goals and a touchdown? No, it was two touchdowns. Two they touchdowns. Scored half and then That's right. Scored before half. That's right. Uh, he took pride in scoring two touchdowns against that Georgia defense. Took pride in being able to cover. He knew he wasn't going to win, but he won for some of his boosters. I can guarantee Hell you yeah. that. So uh, he went. He won for your boy over here. Too. Yeah, he like, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. We're 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 in the airport, uh, and I was with my whole you know CBS crew. Everyone's flying back to Atlanta. Then you know some people going to New York and other spots. Um, but we're watching the game at the bar before we get on the flight, and I'm like. You know, I feel like the worst Georgia fan in the world because I want Georgia to win, obviously. Yeah, but I want to Kentucky to cover. Of course. So I'm like, you're only human. Yeah. So then, you know, just before we board the flight, the 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 field goal gets blocked, and I was like, gosh darn it! I'm like, <laughs> I'm obviously doing the math in my head, like, all right, they make the field goal. It's a 14 point game. Even if Georgia scores a touchdown, they still cover. And I'm like, all right, I'm feeling pretty good. Just make the damn field goal. First off, what a play by Nakobe Dean because they should have had a touchdown. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, perfectly set up play. Yeah. Nakobe breaks, you know, rushes through three offensive linemen pretty much to make the tackle. I mean, you block him, it's a walk in. He could have walked backwards for goodness sake. Yep. I think it was Rodriguez, and it would have been a touchdown. And then I would have felt really good about the spread. But anyways, I'm watching it on my phone, and it's just crappy service on the plane. I mean, just awful. And I can't watch it, but I'm just getting the updates on ESPN of like the game cast. So just the words pop up like five yard play, but the Wi-Fi is so bad that I'm giving I'm getting every update update like every five minutes. <laughs> so I'm just staring at my just phone. Just stressed I'm like, out. I'm like I'm like the game's been over for probably about 45 minutes, but my Wi-Fi is so bad that I'm getting it so slowly. And all you see is like first and goal at the one. I was like yes. Second goal at the one. I was like come on. Third and goal at the one. I was like oh my god, please don't do this to me. And then they scored. I'm like. But I'm not cheering, but I am happy because, you know, obviously the George, the dogs won. Yeah. But I covered, and obviously I needed this week to get to two and three and, 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 and get our lock. So um, great win. No I mean, doubt. Definitely. They're good, How man. Good, that, that team, the offense. Um, the offense is so efficient. I think it, that's the it key. Is. It's just, it, you know, and they could have scored more points. There's oh, no doubt God, about yeah. it. Bowers is an absolute 
man child is a five freshman. five catches 101 yards two touchdowns Stetson 14 to 20 for Whew. 250 yards and three touchdowns this game was out of reach in the fourth quarter Georgia scores early in the fourth quarter with that awesome Brock Bowers touchdown catch where he was looking at Stetson and then located the ball right above his head made an awesome catch uh, to go up 30 to seven Jackpot Lesney misses an extra point yep. first time since 2014 Georgia misses an extra point look I mean that was due to happen, uh, an, an NCAA record, which probably will never get broken. Unfortunately, it did happen at home, and, and Jack was the one who missed that kick. But that Drew, touchdown drive, what's up? Oh, no, I was going to say, you know, what the big the big question was, you know, can we get to Florida, and then we're going to make a decision on the quarterback spot? I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, oh, you're I, talking I, about Stetson or JT? Yeah, weeks. yeah. I mean, look, Stetson is the guy. Yeah, and I'm he, he has to be the guy. The he has to be the guy. Why? For what they've been able to accomplish week in and week out, the consistency that they're developing, the rhythm that they have on offense, the trust that the entire team and the coaching staff has in Stetson to carry out a game plan and execute on game day between the lines, I don't see how you could pull him going into the Florida game, even if JT says he's 100%. Okay, If JT does say he's 100%, hey, that's great. We, we want JT to be healthy. There's no doubt about it. But how can you rely on him? How can you depend on JT to say, hey, man, you're going to get banged up. Coach Grantham's going to bring pressure. You're going to get knocked around, thrown on your ass. It's going to get gritty and nasty down in Jacksonville. You know Stetson will play. You know Stetson will suck it up and say, hey, I'm ready to go. You know, Unless there is a devastating injury, he's going to push through it. I don't know if the coaching staff has that trust in JT Daniels right now. So how can you take out – Stetson, with what they have developed, with the type of football that they are playing, just because JT, who's obviously extremely talented, says he's healthy and ready to go. I don't know. I don't think Kirby would let Coach Munkin do that. I really don't at this juncture. I think Stetson's the go-ahead guy. And unless something bad happens or if he runs into a situation where he just simply you know, can't stop turning the ball over or loses confidence in himself, which I don't see happening. I don't know. I think you have JT at the number two spot, assuming he's healthy heading into the Florida game. I think the best thing, it's so funny, I, I, I texted you afterwards and said, great minds think alike, because you sent me a screenshot, and I would love for you to read this, because yeah, well, I don't know how many fans have, and I sent you the screenshot like at the same exact time, because I saw the, 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 the same um, stat hit the social media world, and I'll let you jump into it, yeah. but it is... It is the thought process of, of JT, and, and 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 I've seen some people like, oh, well, you hate JT, and you've never liked. It. I've never said anything bad about JT. I like JT. I think JT is a good quarterback. I have confidence if JT gets on the field and plays. I'm just in the belief of what Setson's doing right now. Why the hell would you bench him? I know he's the leader of the team. Totally Guys agree. Leaving him, he's taking care of the football. He's winning games. Been super efficient. The offense is running extremely well. Why why throw a wrench into that and 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 Chanted on a stat that Drew's about to share with us now. Since 2019, since JT Daniels' 2019 knee injury, JT has missed 21 of 29 games. He has missed 72.4% of the games he could play in. In the eight games that he actually did play, only two were versus top 25 opponents. Only two had winning records currently or at the end of the season. The combined win-loss record of all eight opponents is 32 and 38. That is a 45% winning percentage. His total touchdown to interception ratio, 16 to 3. Obviously, very, very good right there, but we're noting the competition he's playing against. And his total versus top 25 teams, one touchdown and two interceptions. So do with that what you will. The guy just simply has not been able to play. You missed 21 of 29 games. That is concerning for any coaching staff to make what? a big-time decision moving forward when Georgia, all intents and purposes, are getting geared up to make a national championship run. Well, and then my biggest concern is, too, I mean, we, I talk about the efficiency of this offense right now. It is a well-oiled machine. Todd Munkin has it going. You throw JT in, say he starts for a couple games, and, and we've hit the stat. It's just plain and simple. Yeah. Yep. Some guys get banged up a little bit easier than yep. others. What happens if you put him in – the offense still plays well for two games, but then he gets hurt, and then you have to go back to Stetson. And I know Stetson is Mr. Reliable, but it's nice to be in a rhythm. We talk about the Florida quarterbacks of Dan Mullen going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It's a position that everyone feels good when it's just one guy. 
when there's one voice in the huddle, when there's one commander. And it just – if you go back and forth, if there's another injury with JT, I just think you're bringing a lot of variables in. You are. That, that's well, you a, that's 100% correct. Right correct. It, it, you are 100% correct. Can I throw a hypothetical at you? Yes. It's the first weekend of December. Georgia's playing who knows who in the SEC championship game, presumably Alabama. Big time game. I would guess Georgia's probably undefeated. Alabama already has one loss. Let's say in the first half of that game, Stetson's the starter and he plays terribly. Turns the ball over a couple times. Georgia can't get a first down. Alabama's up by seven, maybe 10 points going into half. Do Coach Munkin and Kirby Smart throw JT out there at the start of the third quarter? Would that be a situation where they would kind of pull the plug, much like Nick Saban has done to Georgia in the past with the uh, Tua-Jalen Hurts situation and vice versa in the national championship and SEC championship games, respectively? What happens in that hypothetical situation? Do you throw JT out there if you need him for a championship-type situation to say, hey, go show us what you got since you're healthy now? Yeah, but that, and that's, that's why you, 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 you keep, obviously, him on the roster, and hopefully there isn't a situation because you have to be scared nowadays of guys hitting the transfer portal if yeah. they bench for any yeah. kind of crazy reason. But yeah, if he's on the roster and, and Setson's – struggling mightily in that first half and, and they, they need a switch up, then yeah, you go to JT and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but right now I'm not anticipating that. And I go back to even last year's game versus Alabama. Stetson was playing just fine in the first half, uh, drop ball on a dig route to burn and really changed that game. Yep. And then Alabama kind of took off from there, but this is, as we've seen a very different Alabama team this year than it was last year. And this is a very different Georgia football team than it was last year too. Yeah. So, I'm not anticipating that, but if, if, if worse comes to worse, Drew, yeah. You, I agree. You, that's why you have JT as the backup. I totally agree, and I think uh, that probably won't have to happen. But it's an interesting thought to kind of keep on top of your mind as Georgia is heading into the second half of the season. They're undefeated. They're 7-0, and 5-0 and in the SEC, number one in the nation, Stetson Bennett at the helm. So Georgia takes care of business against number 11 ranked undefeated Kentucky Wildcats 30 to 13. They do not cover the 22 and a half point spread because Wandale Robinson took a one yard pass from Will Levis with four seconds left in the game after after Mark Stoops called timeout. They did Ooh. get that uh, extra point blocked. But get this that last drive, the game was completely out of reach. 22 plays, 75 yards, 11 minutes, and 23 seconds to take uh, the rest of that game and that, out that, of that reach. That took me about 45 minutes watching it on my phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's wrap this thing up. I got a couple of questions. How about on the Iowa way out. losing? How about Iowa yeah. losing? Well, here's where I'm going. Uh, the Big Ten, obviously, is going to be in big trouble because Iowa was ranked number two. They get whooped up on by Purdue 24 7 at home as well. That is concerning big time. And here's the thing, Aaron. The Big Ten is just about to get into the meat of their schedule. All those teams in the Big Ten East, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, they're all about to start playing each other, so they're about to beat up on one another. Iowa drops the ball against Purdue. Obviously, they're in the Big Ten West. They had a much more favorable schedule trying to stay inside that top four, but they fall out. I think a lot of people right now are looking at Ohio State. Yep. C.J. Stroud, obviously, that offense is catching its rhythm. Most are saying they're still the best team in the Big Ten, okay? Most are saying if they were to win the Big Ten, I think you could all imagine they'll be heavily favored against Michigan at the end of the year, regardless of how Michigan continues to play, just because of how that series moves forward. I think you could easily make the assumption that the College Football Playoff Committee could seriously consider having Ohio State jump Cincinnati later on this season in the College Football Playoff rankings, possibly bouncing Cincinnati from the top four. And here is a tweet that I want to read you. We'll get your thoughts, and then we will save it for Thursday's episode. But Mark Zeno, a radio host here in Atlanta, at Mark Zeno on Twitter, he tweeted this out. I thought it was really kind of fascinating. He said, this is college football chaos I'm here for. One, undefeated Oklahoma State plays undefeated Oklahoma in the final week of the regular season. Loser of that game wins the Big Ten. That's interesting, right? Loser of the game goes to the Big Big 12 championship. Oklahoma or Oklahoma State, depending on who loses Bedlam, wins the Big 12. That would create some chaos right there. Two, one loss Alabama beats undefeated Georgia in the SEC title game. Three, 
One loss, Ohio State wins the Big Ten. Four, one loss, Oregon wins the Pac-12. Five, there's an undefeated Cincinnati. You would have six one-loss Power 5 teams and an undefeated Cincinnati. Who would be in? I'm just telling you right now, if you look at Cincinnati's schedule for this home stretch, I mean, it's like playing high school teams. Um, That will not help them. They help themselves by beating Indiana, by beating Notre Dame, by taking care of business with large margins of victory. But I'm just telling you, you know, the rubber's about to meet the road for these Power 5 conferences. The cream's going to rise to the top. And with their schedule, Cincinnati specifically, in the second half of the season, I, I think they might get screwed again. They need help, and 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 they need to be rooting one for Georgia. You know, I think right now all these schools um, from these other conferences are rooting for Georgia to go undefeated, or not. I mean, to beat Alabama. Yeah. Because Alabama, a two loss. Let's say if Alabama is the team that goes from the West, a two loss Alabama is not going to be in the playoffs unless a bunch of other crazy stuff happens. So I think that that's if that happens, Cincinnati's in. I think done. Didn't we got one SEC team. Um, Cincinnati then makes it. Ohio State makes it. Um, you know, I would still take Cincinnati over Oregon, but I think that that'd be an interesting topic right there. Uh, I do think there's a lot of excitement with with Oklahoma right now and their new quarterback, how yeah. well he looked. Caleb Williams. You know, they kind of to me now are looking a little bit more of a a lock to make the playoffs and win that conference. But yeah, I mean that's that's the crappy thing for Cincinnati is I, I don't think they're going to end up being number two. I know they're number two now. But if Ohio State does what they're, you know, what they're capable of doing, if Oklahoma does what they're capable of doing, then I can see them bouncing to four. But at the end of the day, all that matters is getting into the playoffs. You'd still rather be that two or three spot because you don't want to play Georgia week one um, or in the first round of the playoffs. But, I mean, shoot, for a team like Cincinnati just to make it, that's all that matters. But like I said, first things first, everyone in the country right now is a big Georgia fan. Yeah, yeah. I because if that. Alabama wins – Georgia's still in and Alabama's in and a one loss Alabama goes in above Oregon, yep. goes in above Oklahoma, yep. goes in above Ohio State, I agree. and definitely goes above Cincinnati. For all the chaos that's been the college football season through seven weeks, especially with seemingly week after week top four teams losing, uh, it always seems to kind of shake itself out heading into conference championship week. I would expect this season to be no different whatsoever, but it's going to be fascinating as we race towards the finish line. Time, please slow down. Please slow down. Yeah. We all love college football too much. It's, look, it's almost Halloween. Next thing you know, it'll be Thanksgiving. Then we'll have to At be waiting. At least it feels good outside. Yeah, time. thank God. Thank God. Holy smokes. What game do you have this week? You have a Thursday game this week, correct? I got Thursday game. I'm going to Vegas. Let's go. When do you leave? Going Wednesday? To Vegas. Leaving Wednesday, I need to find a golf course to play in Vegas on Thursday. Oh yeah, dude, Shadow Creek. Because I mean, my game until eight o'clock at night. I'm not going to sit around my hotel room. All where day. are you staying? I don't know. I got to figure out where I'm staying, but I'm going to try to see if I can sneak in 36. Ooh, my man's Ooh. got it all figured out. I love I mean, it. I'll be up early. I'll be on the course at seven. I could easily get 36. I love now. it, my man. Good deal. Um, all right, that's week seven recap here at Punt and Pass. Be sure to follow us on social media at Punt and Pass on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Drew Butler. Aaron is at Aaron Murray 11. Puntandpass.com, the number one destination for all things college football. Anything on the way out, brother man? No, I mean, listen, you, you said it. The season's flying by. It's been fun. And this is really the, the, the best part of the year. Now you start getting to some of these big time rivalry games. Obviously, we'll see Georgia, Florida here in a couple weeks. You get to some of these big time and, and you know conference matchups. Uh, it's been an exciting start to the season. I mean, probably one of the most exciting starts to any seasons I've ever been a part of. All the upsets, all the excitement, all the drama, and I just think it's only going to get better and better and better. And and I'll say this: how how awesome is college football? It's the best. It is There's by far better. the best. There is just absolutely nothing better. We love college football, and we know that you love punt and pass, and we love you. Lots of love for everybody involved. All right, for Aaron, I'm Drew. We'll talk to you on Thursday. See you.